Hello. I'm happy to be with you today. This is the start of our Tuesday lectures, and uh, we are going to choose a topic that has been perplexing many people for some time. Now, many people who speak about uh, mysticism in the different traditions, uh, they always come back to the same point that mysticism is somehow a form of escape, a form of escape from reality. Why would one want to escape from his physical reality? I mean, one would want to escape if there was something wrong with that physical reality. So most of those traditions look at the world we live in as unbalanced, as evil even, and they want to go to a better place. So they resort to other dimensions. They escape into the mystical. Now, this relationship between our world and the mystical uh, needs to be uh, uh, looked at in a, in a better way. Because rather than looking at them as opposites, uh, I would rather look at them as complementary, each playing a role uh, that will somehow benefit the other. Complementarity always leads to a better dimension. So let us have a look and see how can we find the real role of the physical dimension so that we can put it in a complementary relationship to the higher mystical dimensions. To do that, we have to go back to the beginning of creation. Now, it's not going back or forward or somewhere because the beginning of creation is a timeless state that exists all the time. It's always there. So let us go to this state of beyond duality. What happens beyond duality? It's a state where there is no time and space. There are no opposites. There is no activity. There is no motion. There is no thought. There is nothing. Now, comparing the state of non-duality, this original primordial basic state, to the duality of creation, uh, we can take as an example the relationship of uh, sleep to the waking state. Now, in our sleep, we are totally inactive, but somehow there is always this inner activity going on. It is inert, but it's going on somewhere in the subconscious. And then when we wake up, it gets activated into everyday life. So let us look at what can happen in this inert sleep uh, be, before or beyond, you can't say before because there's no before and after, beyond uh, time and space. It's a state of zero and infinity at the same time. How can this be? Now, imagine action happening as a wave like this up and down. Now, if you speed this up and keep speeding it up to infinity, you get a line. So it has a motion that is equal to infinity, but it has the appearance of a motionless line. So it's ultimate motion in a motionless state or what appears to be emotionless state. 
this emotional state is the zero, the zero state before uh, duality. So it's a zero state that somehow in it contains everything in a sleeping form, in an inert form. So consciousness exists in there, but in a form of sleeping consciousness. It is not awake yet. Now, what happens that there is some something stirs, a movement happens. This movement is an activation of the law of time because any movement comes as pulses. I mean, any when you do any movement, it produces a pulse like that, a wave shape. Duality is the result of a pulse. So this first movement creates a pulse that is governed by the law of time. The law of time governs the relationship between the wave uh, top and the wave bottom and the wave length. So we end up with the wave form balanced through a center. So this is the law of time being activated to produce duality. Now, once duality is produced, it is a sort of opposition interacting together in complementarity according to the central or the centering force from the zero state that keeps it in harmony. Now, duality is perfect harmony. By definition, creation in all its level is based on the perfect harmony of duality. So, creation is perfection. There are no flaws in it. There's no good and bad. It's, it's just perfection there. All the laws of nature are active in a creative process that can only have perfection as an outcome. Now, let's take the analogy of a musical symphony. If we have a perfect universal symphony playing with ultimate perfection, but its creator does not have an audience to hear that. Nobody is appreciating this sort of universal beauty. But there is only one consciousness. There's only the creator. There's nothing beyond that. So in an act of secondary level uh, consciousness, the creator of the symphony activates the consciousness of the note itself, of the musical note, to be aware of its own role in the symphony and to be aware of the whole symphony. Now, the note inside the symphony becomes a sort of an observer of the whole symphony. So the note becomes uh, a form of uh, appreciating its role in the universal unity of the symphony. So consciousness has created in this note part of itself into the note so that the note reflects back on the symphony. So there is here consciousness creates a, a change in direction in a sort of self-reflection so that consciousness can appreciate the beauty and perfection of creation. Now, in order to appreciate 
something that is perfect, especially in the world of duality, you need to compare it to something else. But there is no something else. There's only perfection. So the note here has to be given something more than just uh, self-reflection. Because self-reflect on what? I mean, there must be some form of activity for the note to self-reflect on the activity, on the experience, because experience comes from activity. So the note needs a form of activity in order to experience what has happened. So the note, in order to practice self-reflection, it needs experience through activity. And experience through activity uh, comes from a comparative state of opposites. So the activity here has to be done in such a way that it achieves perfect balance, that you have perfection of action. Now, perfection of action as, as an initial stage will not really uh, activate this self-reflection. The self-reflection is uh, it must reflect on different states. So the next step would be to give the note a form of free will in the experience thing of its conscious. It has a free will in order to perform this action. Not to perform the whole action, because creation is performing 99% of the action. But the note needs to be given at least a small, uh, uh, let's say, a small possibility to uh, do its own thing within that action. So the note is given free will to influence part of that action. Now, in being given that free will to influence part of the action, this free will will automatically uh, create imbalance. Why will it automatically create imbalance? Well, of all uh, the species in creation, the human being has been given the, let, let's say, the highest level of self-reflection and free will. I'm not saying the human being is the only species. I'm saying it's the species that manifests this in its fullness. Some other species might have it in different degrees. Now, if the human being has some free will in his action, let's see how is he given that free will? How is he going to exercise it in his action? He has to have a sensory awareness of the activity in order to interact with it. So the human being is given senses in the physical dimension through which he can experience and at the same time interact with the physical dimension. Now, this, these senses gather information that he stores in a data bank and then with time this memory bank, this data bank uh, gets enough meaning through all the interactions and as a result 
a sort of a personality is uh, built, an identity. Now, this identity we call the ego. The ego is a personality created by the five senses. And it interacts with reality through the five senses. By doing that, then it must serve its creator because the only thing the ego is aware of as its creator are the five senses. So it will automatically see only the five senses and the physical world as its creator. And the ego will tend to serve the needs of the five senses. So the ego here builds an identity serving the five senses. Now, the five senses have a certain function. Their function is to propagate life, physical life. But as the ego and the five senses only work through a very small uh, aspect of absolute reality, the five senses can only detect maybe one or two percent of the ranges of absolute reality. So their domain of action is so limited that its impact on the whole is very, very limited in a way that it has to resort to the 99% that it doesn't see in activities that it does not control. For example, in the physical functions of the body, in our biological functions and all that, they are run by the forces of nature that we uh, fortunately do. I mean, that we unfortunately do not control, because if we had some control uh, over those unconscious laws, we would disturb everything. If we were given a manual to run the 99% of unperceived reality, we wouldn't be able to run it for, for, for 10 seconds. So now, we let this unperceived reality run life, while we let the ego run through its free will the physical actions in this life needed to gain experiences. Now, by gaining experiences with only 1% of the information of total reality, we are bound to make a lot of mistakes and we cannot perform anything in perfect balance because we don't have all the information. When you only have 1% of the information, there is no way you can produce perfect balance in your actions. So now, the world, as far as we see it, is seen through the ego, which is a mask that we wear, a mask created by the five senses that we wear, that masks the 99% that we don't see the beauty of creation and we are not aware of all divine laws of creation and we can only see through it the 1%. Now, imbalance results. So, the ego sees the imbalance. So now, people who uh, sort of look into their hearts, into the right brain mode, they look at that and they perceive some of the beauty of the universal consciousness in the other uh, unconscious realms. It is trickle through a bit like that our consciousness and we become slightly aware of them. Now when we become slightly aware of them, we notice the imbalance 
of the sensory ego. And so now we have a duality within us. We have a sort of an unperceived, unconscious universal order that is perfection and beauty acting through a mask of imbalance. So we look at the mask as our, and our identity in this world as a form of evil thing because there's no good and evil. There's balance or imbalance. So imbalance is a form of evil and so we label the world of our ego as an imbalanced evil world and we try to look behind the mask and that's what the mystics do into our right brain consciousness, into our heart and this form of inner reflection is a natural state whenever you have too much problems in the physical level, you tend to float into the other direction, daydream, want to sleep, to relax, or things like that, to get out of it. So getting in and out of it is a natural thing. It's, again, a rhythm. Wake up into the ego, sleep out into the universal consciousness. So, you're balanced between both. Somehow inside you, you see this beauty of universal consciousness. So, you want to shun the ego completely and escape into it. But the ego is here to give you an experience. Avoiding the experience will not help you anywhere. I mean, avoiding an experience. Now, uh, permit me to have a cup of tea. This is a very good experience. My cup of tea is a good experience and it's actually feeding the ego, not the higher self. The higher self we perceive as divinity and in this direction the higher self is multidimensional. If you go into your right brain consciousness, you have individual, collective, universal, you have so many dimensions in there, up to all the levels that comprise everything that we call divinity. So, actually, uh, this beauty of this thing, but then the ego tells me, have a sip of tea. Now, have a sip of tea, that means forget <laughs> the universal consciousness of divinity and come and satisfy my needs as the five senses of the ego. So I drink the tea. Now, there is something wrong in this formula. I mean, why an ego producing imbalance? I mean, there must be a reason for that. If, if the, is, is this world just made to experience imbalance? Is this world made so that we experience imbalance and escape into the mystical? There must be a bigger secret than all that. Now, we come to the bigger secret, which is following or understanding nature. The forming process of nature, the beauty of the forms of nature, this divine pen that keeps writing the shapes of nature and drawing those, all those nice things out there in nature and we have a beauty of nature and unfortunately nobody reads the language of that divine pen. So let us try and understand or read a bit in the language of that divine pen. The divine pen is actually not just a pen that you see in the physical shapes in nature. 
all those physical shapes in nature are manifestations of a higher order. There are archetypal spiritual dimensions that have the templates of everything in nature that come down here. So there's a higher connection in the creation of everything in nature. Those centers are a sort of vortices, multidimensional vortices that connect between di the physical and higher dimensions. The human being has those vortices. As a product of nature, we have what we call the chakras in the body, the energy wheels, and they are sort of vortices that connect to higher dimensions. And as we know that the higher dimensions, they are actually what is running our body. I am not running my heartbeat, my breathing, no. A higher order is doing that. Because before the birth of the ego and the senses, the body has to be alive to begin with. For the body to be alive, you have to have a sort of universal laws interacting, bringing life into the body and bringing blood into the brain and then the senses are activated. So the 1% of free will and activation of the senses is a secondary activity to actually life of the body. The life of the body should not be affected by the activation of the ego. It should be protected from interference of that ego into it. So, while it tries to protect the interference of the ego into it, it does something else too. It tries to bring balance into the actions of the ego through infusing the action with all the universal laws that run our bodies and our existence so perfectly. It tries to infuse those into the action. So what will happen if the action can somehow uh, absorb those laws and put them in the way it acts, it will automatically balance between the positive and negative aspects in the physical dimension and create a new harmony. Now, what, how will that happen? Now, there is a translation that is needed be between the heart, the right brain, and the ego, because the ego exists in time and space. The heart exists, or the higher dimensions, uh, exist beyond time and space. The time and space we know is a sensory thing. Causality as we know it is a sensory thing. So now we need to get the information, the universal information through the right brain mode and the heart. Bring, how will they go, bring, they be brought in our consciousness? How do I perceive them. The only way to do that is first you stamp them with time and space. They are given time and space coordinates and secondly they are associated with something in our meaning level, with our data bank. And through this time space stamping and association with the data bank we become aware of the universal laws. Now, they will appear to us as ethical values. Those laws that harmonize energy, that harmonize all actions, will appear to us as ethical values coming out of our conscience. Now, if you apply those ethical values into 
your daily actions, what will happen? You are actually applying the, all the universal laws that exist on the universal unconscious level. You are uh, applying them under a new name, which is ethical values. But in reality, they are laws that govern and produce harmony. So ethical values are natural laws that govern and produce harmony into action. So by putting those laws, those ethical laws into our actions, uh, we start harmonizing uh, our actions to create perfection. And action that creates perfection through the universal ethics and laws, we label that excellence of action. Excellence of action is an action that is resulting from the participation of the universal laws in our physical reality, and it's a two-way relationship. And at the same time, the excellence of action created here will send those new uh, qualities the resulting from perfection will send them back through the subconscious level into the whole universe. So excellence of action does an important thing to action. The excellence connects the action to the universal mind. And here that means excellence of action plays a role of consciously participating in the harmony and beauty of creation, but consciously participating in there. Now, let us see this conscious participation. It participates not as memory, it doesn't need to take all the memory of our experiences on the other side, but it takes the resultant, uh, the resultant quality of our actions. This is what it will take, what we take to the other side with us. So, when we move beyond this existence, we end up in a world that is, uh, l l let's say, a copy in many ways of what we have here. Our memories of the physical world will project in the other dimension. The other dimension where we're going to live afterwards is a formless dimension that is given form by us when we move there, the first level of, of the ego dissipates here. The self there, the level of the self, still has the memories here. So we form the subtle energy of the other dimensions through experiences here. So we create situations and experiences on the other side, and we live in them. So we are actually creating the other world from here. We are cre creating, through our actions here, we are creating the other world. Now, this is the first step. The other world is created. Now, the second step is what quality does it have? Am I going to go into a world that is full of beauty, that everything is perfect, and uh, where this is the ultimate heaven? Or am I going to go in a, in a world where everything is broken down and all that, and this is my ultimate hell? I mean, what's heaven and hell? Now, these two modes depend on the quality of action we take with us on the other side. So, if the quality of action here uh, 
that produces or puts a certain quality to the reality over there comes from here. We wear glasses from here that make us see the reality over there. So what, uh, what will produce the bad qualities in this other dimension? What will produce the, the, the dimension that I uh, look at as bad or as hell or something like that? What will produce it is our own judgment. In this world, judging others, or even worse, judging oneself, is the biggest problem that we take with us because judgment causes separation and tension. But acceptance of all other produces serenity. And it depends. Am I going on the other side with tension? Then I go in a lower dimension and create tension and separativeness and all that and color my world with those disturbances. If I go in with serenity, accepting all other, then all of a sudden I will change the other world. I will put those qualities in the other world as to make it a sort of heaven. Now, that means that there's a very, very important role for the life here on earth. Because the life in the physical dimension is your only opportunity to exercise free will. And your only opportunity to create excellence of action in order to make or produce excellence in the other dimension. Your action here actually builds the quality of the other dimension. So imagine you are here with an opportunity to create heaven, to create a fantastic life ever after through your free will and excellence of action. Now, it can't be an evil world if this world gives us the opportunity to sort of make our heaven. Now, imagine this world is like uh, if I give you a puzzle, a big puzzle that has a beautiful picture and I put the puzzle in front of you. Now, you can actually start using your uh, visualization your mental capabilities, your emotional capabilities, and try to find associations, try to find the right, the right relationships between the pieces, which pieces fit together. You can't go in a puzzle and say, these are good pieces and these are bad pieces. You can't judge the pieces in a puzzle. You have to find the role of each piece in the puzzle, because every piece in the puzzle produces the excellence of the final puzzles. So your role is not to judge the pieces, but your role is to fit together all the pieces in harmony. And now once you fit together the pieces, you create this wonderful picture that you can take with you. If you don't do that, if you start saying, this is a bad one, I throw it away. I don't like this one, I don't like that. Go to the other side with chaos in your hand, with lots of pieces that have no meaning at all, and get lost with your pieces on the other side, while the person who have managed to make the perfect picture has actually created his heaven on the other side. So, earth, earthly life, is the only opportunity to create the wonderful picture that you take with you to the other side. So, by putting the ethical values into your actions, ethical values comprise so many things. For example, when you are doing an action, 
knowledge is part of those ethical values. If you want to do a certain action, then learn something about it. Learn how to do it. Uh, if you want to achieve perfection, you have to learn. You have to, to keep continuously learning, uh, understanding, and then uh, interacting with others in relationship action. You put benevolence, put all the values in your actions until you create the full pattern of excellence in your action, your picture is complete. And now you can safely take it and go to the other side. Now, this is the true understanding of mysticism. Mysticism is not going into the universal dimension as an escape. No. Mysticism is bringing all the values, all the universal laws from those universal dimensions into the physical existence, create excellence of action. So the mystical dimension is a sort of a tool to create excellence of action, to construct a beautiful, heavenly, uh, eternal afterlife. So I hope that with that we understand that we have in this world an opportunity where excellence of action and interaction is possible. Beyond that, if you miss it, you can't catch up once you're on the other side. You can't catch up, finish what you've done here you take with you, you can't change it. So, this is a wonderful opportunity and the excellence of action is usually uh, a way, action here is a way of dealing with whatever exams are given to you in this life. Excellence of action will make you see every problem in this life or every exam in this life will make you see it as a way of getting better. If you see it as a, as a punishment, there you're sliding into the other side that this is a bad world, this is an evil dimension, why is it doing this to me? If you see that as my unique opportunity to produce excellence of action, that means in this world, I am given the very, very unique opportunity for a short time to be master of my universe. Now, imagine that. Imagine the beauty of being empowered to be the master of your eternal universe. So, with that, let us go out, appreciate this unique opportunity, and work towards being masters of our universe. Thank you, until next time.